story ten of the bet and other stories by anton chekhov this librivox recording is in the public domain story ten overwhelming sensations this happened not so very long ago in the moscow circuit court the jurymen left in court for the night before going to bed began a conversation about overwhelming sensations it was occasioned by someone's recollection of a witness who became a stammerer and turned grey owing as he said to one dreadful moment the jurymen decided before going to bed that each one of them should dig into his memories and tell a story life is short but still there is not a single man who can boast that he had not had some dreadful moments in his past one juryman related how he was nearly drowned a second told how one night he poisoned his own child in a place where there was neither doctor nor chemist by giving the child white copperas in mistake for soda the child did not die but the father nearly went mad a third not an old man but sickly described his two attempts to commit suicide once he shot himself the second time he threw himself in front of a train the fourth a short stout man smartly dressed told the following story i was no more than twenty-two or twenty-three years old when i fell head over heels in love with my present wife and proposed to her now i would gladly give myself a thrashing for that early marriage but then well i don't know what would have happened to me if natasha had refused my love was most ardent the kind described in novels as mad passionate and so on my happiness choked me and i did not know how to escape from it i bored my father my friends the servants by continually telling them how desperately i was in love happy people are quite the most tiresome and boring i used to be awfully exasperating even now i'm ashamed at the time i had a newly called barrister among my friends the barrister is now known all over russia but then he was only at the beginning of his popularity and he was not rich or famous enough to have the right not to recognize a friend when he met him or not to raise his hat i used to go and see him once or twice a week when i came we used both to stretch ourselves upon the sofas and begin to philosophize once i lay on the sofa harping on the theme that there is no more ungrateful profession than a barrister's i tried to show that after the witnesses have been heard the court can easily dispense with the crown prosecutor and the barrister because they are equally unnecessary and only hindrances if an adult juryman sound in spirit and mind is convinced that this ceiling is white or that ivanov is guilty no demosthenes has the power to fight and overcome his conviction who can convince me that my moustache is carroty when i know it is black when i listen to an orator i may perhaps get sentimental and even shed a tear but my rooted convictions for the most part based on the obvious and on facts will not be changed an atom my friend the barrister contended that i was still young and silly and was talking childish nonsense in his opinion an obvious fact when illumined by conscientious experts became still more obvious that was his first point his second was that a talent is a force an elemental power a hurricane that is able to turn even stones to dust not to speak of such trifles as the convictions of householders and small shopkeepers it is as hard for human frailty to struggle against a talent as it is to look at the sun without being blinded or to stop the wind by the power of the word one single mortal converts thousands of convinced savages to christianity ulysses was the most convinced person in the world but he was all submission before the sirens and so on all history is made up of such instances in life we meet them at every turn and so it ought to be otherwise a clever person of talent would not be preferred before the stupid and untalented i persisted and continued to argue that a conviction is stronger than any talent though speaking frankly i myself could not define what exactly is a conviction and what is a talent probably i talked only for the sake of talking 
take even your own case said the barrister you are convinced that your fiance is an angel and that there's not a man in all the town happier than you i tell you ten or twenty minutes would be quite enough for me to make you sit down at this very table and write to break off the engagement i began to laugh don't laugh i'm talking seriously said my friend if i only had the desire in twenty minutes you would be happy in the thought that you have been saved from marriage my talent is not great but neither are you strong well try please i said no why should i i only said it in passing you're a good boy it would be a pity to expose you to such an experiment besides i'm not in the mood to-day we sat down to supper the wine and thoughts of natasha and my love utterly filled me with a sense of youth and happiness my happiness was so infinitely great that the green-eyed barrister opposite me seemed so unhappy so little so grey but do try i pressed him i beg you the barrister shook his head and knit his brows evidently i had begun to pour him i know he said that when the experiment is over you will thank me and call me saviour but one must think of your sweetheart too she loves you and your refusal would make her suffer but what a beauty she is i envy you the barrister sighed and swallowed some wine and began to speak of what a wonderful creature my natasha was he had an uncommon gift for description he could pour out a whole heap of words about a woman's eyelashes or her little finger i listened to him with delight i've seen many women in my lifetime he said but i give you my word of honour i tell you as a friend your natasha andreevna is a gem a rare girl of course there are defects even a good many i grant you but still she is charming and the barrister began to speak of the defects of my sweetheart now i quite understand it was a general conversation about women one about their weak points in general but it appeared to me then as though he was speaking only of natasha he went into raptures about her snub nose her excited voice her shrill laugh her affectation indeed about everything i particularly disliked in her all this was in his opinion infinitely amiable gracious and feminine imperceptibly he changed from enthusiasm first to paternal edification then to a light sneering tone there was no chairman of the bench with us to stop the barrister riding the high horse i hadn't a chance of opening my mouth and what could i have said my friend said nothing new his truths were long familiar the poison was not at all in what he said but altogether in the devilish form in which he said it a form of satan's own invention as i listened to him i was convinced that one and the same word had a thousand meanings and nuances according to the way it is pronounced and the turn given to the sentence i certainly cannot reproduce the tone or the form i can only say that as i listened to my friend and paced from corner to corner of my room i was revolted exasperated contemptuous according as he felt i even believed him when with tears in his eyes he declared to me that i was a great man deserving a better fate and destined in the future to accomplish some remarkable exploit from which i might be prevented by my marriage my dear friend he exclaimed firmly grasping my hand i implore you i command you stop before it is too late stop god save you from this strange and terrible mistake my friend don't ruin your youth believe me or not as you will but finally i sat down at the table and wrote to my sweetheart breaking off the engagement i wrote and rejoiced that there was still time to repair my mistake when the envelope was sealed i hurried into the street to put it in a pillar box the barrister came with me splendid superb he praised me when my letter to natasha disappeared into the darkness of the pillar box i congratulate you with all my heart i'm delighted for your sake after we had gone about ten steps together the barrister continued of course marriage has its bright side too 
i for instance belong to the kind of men for whom marriage and family life are everything he was already describing his life all the ugliness of a lonely bachelor existence appeared before me he spoke with enthusiasm of his future wife of the pleasures of an ordinary family life and his transports were so beautiful and sincere that i was in absolute despair by the time we reached his door what are you doing with me you damnable man i said panting you've ruined me why did you make me write that accursed letter i love her i love her and i swore that i was in love i was terrified of my action it already seemed wild and absurd to me gentlemen it is quite impossible to imagine a more overwhelming sensation than mine at that moment if a kind man had happened to slip a revolver into my hand i would have put a bullet through my head gladly well that's enough enough the advocate said patting my shoulder and beginning to laugh stop crying the letter won't reach your sweetheart it was i not you wrote the address on the envelope and i muddled it up so that they won't be able to make anything of it at the post office but let this be a lesson to you don't discuss things you don't understand now gentlemen next please the fifth juryman had settled himself comfortably and already opened his mouth to begin his story when we heard the clock strike from spesky church tower twelve one of the jurymen counted to which class gentlemen would you assign the sensations which our prisoner at the bar is now feeling the murderer passes the night here in a prisoner's cell either lying or sitting certainly without sleeping and all through the sleepless night listens to the striking of the hours what does he think of what dreams visit him and all the jurymen suddenly forgot about overwhelming sensations the experience of their friend who once wrote the letter to his natasha seemed unimportant and not even amusing nobody told any more stories but they began to go to bed quietly in silence End of story ten.